Hello and welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green. This is a contextualized reading for The Odyssey by Homer, and we're going to be doing Book 10. In my last lecture on Book 9, uh, I mentioned one of the more recent texts that uh, has brought up a kind of critique of Homer and Western civilization. Um, and so I'm doing this a, a, a little bit just to, to let listeners or audience members know I'm not coming up with these critiques or the so-called critique of Western civilization on my own. It's a broad um, uh, public um, discourse that's happening right now. Um, and I've taken, you know, as this first class for the Center of Critical and Cultural Theory, I've, I, I'm, I'm I've decided to look at one of the classics, the foundational classics of so-called Western civilization. Um, in, in the last lecture, I, I mentioned Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment. I will have future lectures that deal more explicitly with that critique, but because Adorno and Horkheimer are very well known in the field of critical theory, um, uh, for those of you who might be wondering why I've begun a course, my first course with a piece of literature instead of uh, classic critical theory. Um, uh, you, maybe you can see where I'm going. Uh, more recently, um, uh, along the same lines of the critique of Western civilization, um, is a wonderful book uh, titled Savage Anxieties, The Invention of Western Civilization by um, Robert A. Williams Jr., who's a wonderful wonderful scholar um, in general. So I, I suggest all of his books. Um, the, the American Indian and Western Legal Thought is one of you know, my uh, most revered books. I, I really, really um, admire um, the work of Williams. But this is a, a book that Williams wrote. I think it came out around 2013 or so. Um, and on page 21, he says, um, he's talking about Homer and the idea of the savage, right? And this classic idea, this distinction, and you've heard me, those of you who've seen the earlier lectures, invoking a little bit more and more of that tension between the European colonizers, sometimes I use the term Euro-Christian colonizers, and indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, which I'll use as the name for the continent of North America that I'm sitting on. Um, as a as as a colonizer myself, right, a, a Euro Christian colonizer, um, uh, uh, so just to self identify that way. Um, when I use the term Euro Christian, as I've said over and over again, it has nothing to do with religious belief. It's a social movement, all lowercase, all one word, Euro Christian, and those values, which maybe we could tap into the broader notion of Western civilization, those values which so much shape the legal traditions um, the, and the govern the traditions of governance that still inhabit the United States of America. Um, so in this book, um, uh, on page 21, um, uh, Williams is talking about Homer and the Greeks in general, and, 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 and he's talking about this notion of the hero. The hero in this kind of binary term of, for the Greeks is like, the, the culture hero of Odysseus is who the text sets up as the ideal against the lawless brute or savage, right? And so William says, typically in Greek myths and legends, the hero encounters the most threatening, strange, and alien-seeming forms of savagery venturing on the most distant, chaotic, uncharted fringes of the known world the eschatai in Greek. Um, and so just that, like that word eschatology means the study of the end of things. The eschatai, um, William says, represented the uncultivated periphery in ancient Greek cosmology, an indeterminate, terrifying, primordial space ruled by untamed beasts, man-eating monsters, and the savage forces of nature. According to the ancient cosmographic myths and creation stories, the lands, waters, peoples, and other beings encountered in the threatening alien hybrid-prone zone 
at the periphery would be radically divergent from what the Greeks knew at the more familiar orienting center of their own world. And of course, Odysseus, this is the story of Odysseus, being out on these fringes and wanting and longing and desiring to be back home. But as he does so, he contrasts himself as God-fearing, as law-abiding against the barbarian savages that he encounters along the way. And in the last contextualized reading for um, book nine, we dealt particularly with the Cyclops, right? Um, and uh, um, uh, the, the notion of the Cyclops um, being this loner, this wild person, uncultivated lands, which I was contrasting with people like John Locke, um, uh, the, the English colonizer um, who had plantations in um, the North American continent and who wrote all of these uh, influential governing treatises um, that would then come to influence the so-called founding fathers of the United States. Um, because he had this land in, in the new colonized territories. Um, William says on page 27, and this is in a little um, uh, passage called the Cyclops Man Cave. Um, even at this point in the early literary traditions of the West, we've already seen the tired stereotype of the drunken savage. Recall that in the story of the Centauromachi, cited by Nestor in the Iliad, the centaurs were also unable to control their bestial primitive urges and were punished for violating Xenia, the law of civilization, after imbibing too much wine at the wedding of um, uh, uh, Parathus and um, Hippodamia. Skipping down a little bit. Like the savage tribes of centaurs referenced by Nestor in the Iliad, the Odyssey's depiction of the lawless and inhuman Cyclops monster likely combines elements from several ancient Greek myths and legends. In Greek mythology, the Cyclopses are usually identified as one -eyed, a one-eyed race of giants who forged the weapons used by the gods of Olympus in the overthrow of the Titans. The ancient Greeks believed that the colossal stones comprising the Cyclopean walls of Agamemnon's palace at Mycenae had been built by this mythic race of giants. And then skipping down towards the end of this little passage on page 29, uh, that only great mythic warrior heroes like Odysseus or Theseus or Heracles had the arete, the excellence, remember from an earlier contextualized reading, to take on such monstrous beings could not help but make this dark-sided version of the savage all the more threatening and anxiety-producing for the Greeks as they carried their Homer with them on their colonizing voyages to distant lands inhabited by strange alien primitive tribal peoples. Um, now Williams, of course, is hinting at, at the later Euro-Christian, in my terminology, Euro-Christian um, colonization of uh, the continent that I sit on as well, uh, um, who embrace not only um, their um, Christian sense of governance at the time, but their recently um, renewed interest in the ancient world um, of the ancient Greeks, the Renaissance, right? The rebirth of knowledge among the the Western or uh, the Euro, uh, Western Europe's um, elite who um, come up with the governing um, ideologies that found, it, found the nation states in the ways that the world works today. Um, so I will go into that in d deeper in other lectures, but I just wanted to um, look at a couple of other authors for where this critique is coming from, um, just to let students or people who are watching this know um, that this is not just stuff I'm making up on my own in terms of the critique of Western civilization. In book 10, we get the bewitching queen of Aia. She's been mentioned as Circe um, in other um, books so far. As we already know that um, Odysseus, Odysseus is going to make it home. We're still in Odysseus talking 
or telling his, doing his storytelling to the Phaeacians of how he came to be among them. Uh, and so he discusses, um, uh, we open with uh, Odysseus who continues to speak. We reach the Aeolian island next in the home of Aeolus, um, Hippotas' son, be beloved by the gods who never die. A great floating island it was, and round it all, huge ramparts rise of indestructible bronze, and sheer rock cliffs shoot up from the sea to the sky. The king had sired twelve children within his halls, six daughters and six sons in the lusty prime of youth. So he gave his daughters as wives to his six sons, seated beside their dear father and doting mother, with delicacies of plenty spread before them they feast on forever all day long the halls breathe and savor of roasted meats and echo round the low moan of blowing pipes and all night long each one by his faithful mate they sleep under soft piled rugs on corded bedsteads to this city of theirs we came their splendid palace and aeolus hosted me one entire month he pressed me for news of Troy and the Argive ships. Um, and so he goes on. And so this is a contrast, of course, to this barbarous savage, the Cyclops in the last um, book, right? And um, as the law of Xenia requires, um, Aeolus um, uh, fills, um, uh, gives all sorts of gifts, um, parting gifts to Odysseus including a sack of winds. He is magically able to hold the winds back in a sack, all except for the one that is going to be speediest to Odysseus on his voyage home. Um, and then we get this theme of sleep showing up again. We've already seen that with the Phaeacians, right? Um, Odysseus and his men are sailing home from Aeolus, and uh, they almost reach home. Odysseus falls asleep. While he's asleep, his men get mutinous, and they say, you know, Odysseus is taking too much treasure for himself from Aeolus. Let's, let's look through Aeolus's um, gifts to him uh, and, and uh, distribute it among ourselves. And in doing so, they find the sack of winds, they open it up, they unleash all of the wrong winds, which drives them further back away, even though Ithaca was in their sight right? It drives them far away. Um, they go all the way back to Aeolus, or to Aeolia, um, and they, uh, Odysseus pleads with Aeolus again, and this is something that he does that's wrong, right? It goes against Xenia. He's already been a stranger. He's already been treated well, he's taken parting gifts, and now he's returned too soon. And um, uh, even he asks, uh, the, Odysseus explains what happens, but that what happened, but that's not okay to do. And so Aeolus says, away from my island fast, most cursed man alive. It's a crime to host a man or to, or speed him on his way when the blessed Deathless gods despise him so. Crawling back like this, it proves the immortals hate you. Out. Get out. And so this is something that one shouldn't do, apparently, according to the culture. Um, you send someone on the way, their way with the gifts, but they don't come back and they ask for more right away. So there seems to be a limit on what you can ask for in terms of um, uh, uh, the law of hospitality. You might compare this passage with the notion, um, with, with a similar one, um, with the character of Polycrates in Herodotus, who's the ancient Greek historian. And Polycrates um, uh, suffers from the opposite, where he keeps having too much good luck. Um, and uh, um, he throws a ring into a sea, for example, and it comes back to him as well and and he loses his friends his friends want nothing to do with him because he's he's getting too much luck from the gods and too much goodness and and they know that something drastic and bad is bound to happen to him so there's this sense of balance 
that I think is very old in the world, and it's a sense that exists, I think, in indigenous cultures in the world. But the Greeks here are distinguishing themselves from indigenous pe peoples of the world by saying what their notion of civilization is, or what this notion of Western civilization is, that people who use this text to back up their own notions of supremacy um, have. Um, so Odysseus's men sail away from Aeolia. They come to the land of the last Dragonians. Um, and here, um, uh, which is a kind of contrast to uh, Odysseus and his away team of 12 people among the Cyclopses, Odysseus holds back and sends a team ahead. Um, and the team um, goes and uh, um, all, um, uh, so first of all, all of, um, all, so Odysseus has 12 ships at this point. Um, uh, he holds his own ship back and all of the other ships um, are, go into harbor. He stays out. He doesn't tell us why, though, but he says, I alone anchored my black ship outside, well clear of the harbor's jaws. I tied her fast to the cliffside with a cable. I scaled its rock face to look at its crest, but glimpsed no trace of work of man or beast from there. All I spied was a plume of smoke drifting off the land, so I sent some crew ahead to learn who lived there. Um, and they go off and they... Um, uh, meet the daughter of the king and then they who ushers them on to the kingdom and they meet a big fat queen um, who is unnamed here um, but she's the queen of An Antiphates um, and uh, who calls to her king and he comes and they quote prepared my crew a barbarous welcome snatching one of my men he tore him up for dinner the other two sprang free and reached the ships but the king let loose a howling through the town that brought the tremendous lastragonians swarming up from every side hundreds not like men like giants they all throw rocks and they smash the ships that are all harbored our entire squadron sank and so odysseus is left with only one ship now his own ship and they sail on to the island of Aiea, which is the home of the witch Circe, um, who's introduced here as a nymph with lovely braids, an awesome power too, who can speak with human voice, the true sister of murderous minded Aedes. Both were bred by the sun who lights our lives. Their mother was Percy, the child of that the ocean bore. We brought our ship to port without a sound as a god eased her into the harbor safe and snug and for two days and two nights we lay there eating our hearts out bent with pain and bone tired um, when dawn rose with her lovely locks on the third day at least last i took my spear and my sharp sword again rushed up from the ship to find a lookout point hoping to glimpse some sign of human labor catch some human voices I scaled the commanding crag, scanning hard. I could just make out some smoke from Circe's halls. Um, drifting up from the broad terrain through the brush and woods, mulling it all over, I thought I'd scout the ground. That fire aglow in the smoke, I saw it true. But soon enough, this seemed to me the better plan. I'd go back to shore and then swift to the swift ship first, feed the men, then send them for scouting. I was well on my way down nearing the ship when a good pity took on me, wandering all alone there. Um, he sent, sorry, when a god took pity on me. Um, he sent me a big stag with high branching antlers and Odysseus then kills the stag out in uh, the middle of the wilderness. And um, we see this is kind of a tall tale, right? Like he kills the stag and then he sticks this, this massive stag on his spear and carries it home over the shoulder. Um, uh, so this makes Odysseus look massive, of course. Um, uh, there was no, uh, oh, oh, he says, I loaded around my neck. I lugged him towards the ship, sorry. And, and then on my spear, no way to sling him over the shoulder. 
um, he the kill was so immense. So he's talking about how big, how, how big the bull was, or the stag. Um, and so, uh, um, nevertheless, it still seems like this kind of tall tale. Like, if, like, like. I mean, if anyone has ever been around and trying to 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 take a whole um, a, a massive stag out um, of the forest on one's own. Um, uh, so then he flings him home. So so he he he's doing something like the, of of a leader. He's bringing home this meat for his sailors who are sad about losing the rest of their fleet among the last Lagonians. Um, um, and uh, he says he sees smoke off in the distance, and he wants to send out an away team again. And of course, the the men are all weary. It breaks their hearts because they remember um, the L Lastragonian king Antifates and the hardy cannibal Cyclops thirsting for our blood. So they break into cries, wailing, streaming live tears. Um, um, but this line keeps coming up, what good can come from grief? Um, and so he sends off his men-at-arms, but Yuri Lachis um uh one of them says that he wants to hold back um and uh he says we've already lost enough men um uh why do we do this it's we're just going to meet the same sort of end um uh um uh deep in the wooded glens they come came upon Circe's palace um, uh, built of dr built of dressed stone and cleared rise of the land, mountain wolves and lions. I'm getting ahead of myself. Your luck is later on. Um, uh, um, is is uh, is worried about going back. Um, we get here again a description of wild beasts. This is similar to the Polyphemus um, uh, uh, opening. It's a contrast to the Phaeacian palace. Again, we get wild beasts who crowd around this away team of men who go by Circe's door. They're snarling, they're hovering around, but they don't attack them. Uh, they paused at the doors in the nymph with lovely braid Circe. Um, they hear inside singing, and uh, this attracts the men who then go in. They are treated at first kindly. They're given food to eat and then this potion to drink, which turns the men into um, pigs. Uh, and then Circe um, uh, um, pushes them out. Uh, and so uh, there's a theme here. Eurylochus is like Odysseus, a kind of Odysseus, right? Um, this is where Eurylochus is the one who had stayed behind while the other men went in. So earlier, Odysseus had stayed behind. Um, so Eurylochus is able to come back and report what has happened to uh, Odysseus's men. And so uh, Odysseus dis um, says, okay, let's go get the men. And Eurylochus says, no, I don't want to go here. So I was getting ahead of myself earlier. Um, uh, I shot back, Eurylochus, stay right here, eating and drinking safe by the black ship. I must be off. Necessity drives me on. Um, leaving the ship and shore, I headed inland, clambering up through the hushed entrancing, entrancing glades until I was nearing the halls of Circe's skilled spells approaching her palace. And then on his way, Odysseus set, meets Hermes, and Hermes warns him about Circe and what she's going to do to him, and um, gives him a potion to protect himself. Um, and so he goes on into Circe's halls, and uh, he gets um, uh, uh, Circe tries with him what she's done to his other men, but it doesn't work. And so then she coaxes him to bed, just as Hermes says she's going to do. Um, Hermes says, "Don't go to the goddess's bed until you swear her not to an oath not to hurt you." or your friends. Um, and so Odysseus does this exactly um, uh, as um, Hermes, is, Hermes has said. He drinks this herb that the gods call moly. Um, and then 
uh, when this happens and um, uh, Odysseus is not transformed, um, Circe recognizes Odysseus at once. She says, who are you? Where do you come from? Your city, your parents. I'm wonderstruck. You drank my drugs, but you're not bewitched. Never has any other man withstood my potion. Never. Once it's passed his lips and drunk it down, you have a mind in you. No magic can enchant. You must be Odysseus, man of twists and turns. Hermes, the giant killer, god of the golden wand. He always said you'd come. So this theme of self-identification is now being recognized in this book by um, Circe. Odysseus swears Circe to an oath, and then her handmaids, who are all nymphs, so even a goddess, a nymph here, an immortal, has servants as well, who are also nymphs. They give him a warm bath. Remember, Odysseus had had a warm bath um, earlier, and so this is showing up, um, uh, uh, this kind of more civilized treatment. Um, before finally going to bed with her, um, Circe um, is sworn to, um, Odysseus uh, uh, gets her to, to free his own men. Um, uh, how could I go to bed with you, you know, with my, with my men looking like full grown swine? Um, and so then uh, uh, she, she does whatever he says, right? Um, and then he, she tells Odysseus again um, to go bring the rest of his crew back from uh, the shore. Um, and so Odysseus goes to get the men, and of course Eurylochus wants to hold back again. Um, uh, and um, Odysseus says to him, um, poor fools, where are we running now? Or so, so Eurylochus says, poor fools, where are we running now? Why are we tempting fate? Why stumble blindly down to Circe's halls? And Odysseus rebukes him um, and says, stay here if you want, you know. Uh, but then he reluctantly follows behind them. Uh, they get back to Circe's. All the while, Circe had bathed my other comrades in her palace, caring and kindly rubbed them with sleek oil and decked them out with fleecy cloaks and shirts. We found them all together feasting in the halls. We, once we'd recognized each other, gazing face to face, we broke all. We all broke down and wept, and the house resounded now. And Circe, then. The lustrous one came toward me pleading, Royal son of Laertes, Odysseus, man of action, no more tears now, calm these tides of sorrow. Well I know what pains you bore on the swarming sea, what punishment you endured from the hostile men of the land. But come now, eat your food and drink your wine till some courage fills your chests. Now and as then, when you set first set sail from the native land, from rocky Ithaca. And so she hosts them, and she hosts them for an entire year until his comrades say, um, we want to go home, Odysseus. And when Odysseus asks Circe, she says, okay, I'll grant you passage home. But the only way that you can get home is that you're going to have to go through the underworld. Um, uh, and so Odysseus has been here making love with Circe in that luxurious bed of hers. Um, and she says, um, Royal son of Laertes, Odysseus, old campaigner, stay on no more in my house against your will, but first another journey calls. You must travel down to the house of death and the awesome one Persephone, there to consult the ghost of Tiresias, seer of Thebes, the great blind prophet whose mind remains unshaken. Even in death, Persephone has given him wisdom. Uh, everlasting vision to him and him alone the rest of the dead are empty filling shades so we get a little bit of a glimpse into the greek culture's um perception of the afterlife here um uh so she said um she said and crushed the, it crushed the heart inside of me and odysseus breaks down is no, i have to go to another place again before getting home um and then he says, Circe, who can pilot us on this way? How, who's going to show us the way? Uh, she says, don't worry. Um, I'm going to send you with the north wind. Um, 
Uh, but once your vessel has cut across the ocean river, you will raise a desolate coast on Persephone's grove, her tall black poplars, willows whose fruit dies young, um, uh, will be there. Beach your vessel hard on the ocean's churning shore and make your own way down the, to the moldering ho um, house of death. And there, into Asheron, the flood of grief, two rivers flow, the torrent river of fire and the wailing river of tears that branches off from Styx, the stream of hate. And this dark crag looms where two rivers thunder down and meet. Once go there, go forward, he wrote, do as I say now. And then we get these instructions of how to get into the underworld. Dig a trench of about a forearm's depth and length around it, pour libations out to all the dead, first with milk and honey, and then with mellow wine, then water, third, and last, spr and sprinkle glistening barley over all of it, and vow again and again to all the dead, to the drifting, listless spirits of their ghosts, that once you return to Ithaca, you will slaughter a barren heifer in your halls, the best you have, and load a pyre with treasures, and to Tiresias alone, apart you will offer a sleek black ram, and pride all of your herds. And once your prayers have invoked the nations of the dead in their dim glory, slaughter a ram and a black ewe, turning both their heads towards Erebus, but turn your head away, looking toward the ocean river. Suddenly then the countless shades of the dead will and gone will surge around you there, but order your men once at once to flay the sheep that lie before you killed by your ruthless blade and burn them both and then say prayers to the gods to the almighty god of death and dread persephone but you draw your sharp sword from your hip sit down on alert there and never let the ghosts of the shambling shiftless dead come near that blood till you have questioned tiresias yourself soon soon the great seer will appear before you captain of armies he will tell you the way to go, the stages of your voyage, and how to come across the swarming seas and reach home at last. Um, and so this is an intense um, ritualized instruction that um, Circe gives. Um, she is known as the witch because she has this knowledge of how to get into the underworld. And notice that there's a promise to a sacrifice back in Ithaca. So the dead are promised something in the future that they are going to get. And it's that that assures that Odysseus is going to get back out of the land of the dead because they're all expecting him to return to the land of the living to begin with um, and by showing up. So there's a negotiation process that's always at work in the notion of sacrifice. And I have other lectures that will just deal with the notion of sacrifice. Um, uh, so after the promise of the future sacrifice comes, then we get another sacrifice. Um, there is something similar that we could look into if we were really digging into classical um, notions of sacrifice, again, of uh, hints of the suo terilia, although no pigs are sacrificed in these particular ceremonies. Um, uh, remember earlier in this book, um, uh, she has turned Odysseus's men into pigs, and so there, there's going to be that type of, of relationship between the men and pigs going on here. Um, so after Circe gives these instructions, um, uh, she's been talking to Odysseus all night. Um, dawn rises, they leave the luxurious bed, and um, uh, Odysseus, Odysseus leads his men back to the ships. But one of the men, and this is a peculiar little instance, one of the men, men Elpinor, youngest in his ranks, had gotten too drunk um, in the night, and um, uh, he had... Um, uh, went out of the halls and bedded down on the roofs and when he gets roused in the morning he wakes up startled and falls down to his death um, uh, it's just an interesting glimpse there um, and then he's once on their way 
um, Odysseus explains to his men who um, uh, that, that they are not going to be able to travel right back home to Ithaca, that they have to make this stop in the land of the dead at first. And of course, this sets his men a wailing because they're so tired and they just want to go home. Uh, but back to the ship they go and they maneuver on to the kingdom of the dead, which we will pick up in book 11. If, once again, uh, you are finding these contextualized readings helpful at all, and want to contribute to us on uh, Patreon, please do so for as much as a cup of coffee a month. <laughs> um, uh, it can really keep the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory afloat. This is very much an endeavor um, that is a labor of love for me at the point that I'm making this video. Um, we have all sorts of costs like internet hosting fees um, to keep running. Um, uh, and so feel free to contribute if you're getting something out of this. Um, thank you. Um, you can also subscribe to us on YouTube, um, like and share our work with other people, um, uh, and, and pay attention to other courses that we will have coming up as well. But that's the end of the contextualized reading for book 10. We will catch up with you uh, in another reading of book 11 coming up. Have a great day or night or morning, wherever and whenever you are. Thanks for your attention.